Oh, come on. You knew when I was reviewing You Only Live Twice that I had to break out the kimono again. In all honesty, I like to wear this kimono more often. It's very comfy, it makes me feel very feminine, and well, it's just very easy to wear. Now, how does it stack up to the last one I read? Thunderbolt. Well, this one is a whole lot better. <laughs> Now the major thing about this book is there's actually quite a lot of spoilers. So I'm going to start this review going over the general ideas of the story. And I'll pause it for a moment and then I'll get into the spoiler territory. Our adventure takes James Bond to Japan. His mission is deceptively simple, but according to the outfit he is in, it is impossible. Essentially, the Japanese are masters of cartography and have gotten a lot of sensitive information over the years. However, they don't really feel much like sharing it as they are to the protection of the United States government. Their secrets then go to them and then the Americans are supposed to give the information to the British, but that hasn't happened yet. One's mission is to meet up with a one Tiger Tanaka and convince him to give over a cipher. It takes a little while. But Bond is able to form a pretty good relationship with Tiger, and that is where he gets the cipher. However, the price for the cipher is very high. A very mysterious doctor known as Dr. Shatterhand has taken over an old castle and just filled it with all types of death traps. Poisonous plants, poisonous animals, piranhas, molten lava lakes, what have you. And, hmm, now this is a little weird. I'm not really sure how accurate this is to Japanese culture, but the way it's simply put is that it is better to commit suicide than it is to fail horribly and bring great dishonor onto the family. So a lot of Japanese people have been waking their way into this old castle and have just been committing suicide. The doctor has had enough of all these people, so he's rigged up a giant balloon on top of the castle as a warning to say violators will be prosecuted. However, this really doesn't work. As a last-ditch effort, Bond is sent in to kill the person who owns this castle. He is known to wear a full samurai suit as a way to protect him from all the poisonous gases as well as all the poisonous animals on the property. Before this assassination attempt can begin, first Bond must become completely Japanese. So he is just immersed into the Japanese culture, or at least what a British person thinks of the Japanese culture. He is taught some of the ways of ninjutsu, given some of their equipment and is then brought to a mysterious island inhabited by Ama. This is essentially a separate tribe from the mainland, mostly of women that are very good swimmers, that for the most part keep to themselves but come to the mainland for life-sustaining supplies. They make their money for diving down to pick up rare and expensive shells, as well as other creatures that could be worth quite a lot of money. Now what's important to note is that during none of this, Bond picks up any Japanese. He is at the mercy of translators. So for this Ama Island, there is a old movie star known as Kissy Suzuki, who is very good at English because of her Hollywood career, but didn't like the life so much, so she went back to being an Ama. So she has explained the story, and they in turn explain it to the tribe, Basically, Bond is not going to be there for very long as he's going to kill the person that lives in this castle of death, as everybody seems to have called it. What's rather interesting is that even the Ama don't take very kindly to the mysterious Dr. Shatterhand and his castle of death. They call him a devil, and that there's a prophecy that some great western power is going to come in and take care of him. And would you know, Bond is just that. A bit of a battle. But Bond is able to sneak into the castle and eventually subdue the great Dr. Shatterhand. And blowing up his base at the same time and using the legendary balloon in order to get away. 
The only problem with this is Bond takes a lot of beating, mostly to the head, so he is given a severe case of amnesia. Luckily, Kissy is nearby in order to bring him back to the mainland. However, she doesn't want him to go back to England. So instead, she convinces him that he has always been a Japanese, part of their tribe, and that he is her husband. After enough time, though, a stray newspaper article comes by, stating some Russian words. This is one of the few things that Bond can remember, so he thinks that he is part of the KGB. And the book ends with him on his way to the KGB headquarters. Now, the other thing to note as well is that while Bond is in this amnesia state, he is on the island for quite a while and eventually has a kid with Kissy Suzuki. So like I said, that is the very basic story of this. Now before I get into the spoiler territory, I feel like I should briefly go over the man with the golden gun. So, as I've mentioned, James Bond has a fear case of amnesia and thinks that he is a KGB spy. So, in this book, he is brainwashed to assassinate M. And this is a really tense and interesting scene, something I wish they could do into the movies. It'd be nice to kind of change it up. I mean, could you imagine Daniel Craig, Henry Cavill, or whoever they're going to get to replace him, just kind of going crazy and about to kill M when all of a sudden a giant sheet of bulletproof glass is able to protect M before the bullet is able to reach his forehead? M takes this as a challenge. He is annoyed that KGB took one of his best agents and brainwashed him. So, he's going to reverse brainwash him and send him to take on one of their ruthless agents, Francisco Scaramanga, or the man with the golden gun. It's rather interesting how they describe him here. They say that, and this is something that also kind of comes in the movie a little bit, he is a trick shot, he used to work for the circus, Never really had any friends except for one single elephant. Now the only problem is, the elephant kind of went rogue and tried to destroy the tent. However, the ringmaster didn't take very kindly to this and put the elephant down. And after that point, Francisco has been a great assassin for the KGB. Because after that he went insane and killed everybody at the circus and has enjoyed doing it ever since. So, the majority of the middle of the story is kind of vague, but the main thing is it gets to a point where both Bond and Francisco are at the end, basically just going toe-to-toe -to -toe fighting each other with the fisticuffs. And Bond is able to take him out. I know there's a lot more to it than that, but that, that's the basic gist. Now, unfortunately, Ian Fleming died before he could write any more stories, so it was interesting to think that perhaps maybe they would have went somewhere with the sun maybe going into the service or something like that. In fact, there's even some spots in here where it just kind of seems like his mind wasn't fully into it, and rightfully so. It's kind of hard to put a lot of creative emphasis when you're on your deathbed. But, at least he was able to finish it, unlike that one famous piece by F. Scott Fitzgerald. So that is the Generals. Now we get into the spoiler territory. So if you do not want any major spoilers, keep having fun. If you don't mind, or if you read the stories, then here we go. So I've covered Thunderball, the idea that this is the story that introduced the evil multi-nation organization known as Spectre. Their major plans to capture two atomic bombs and then hold the world for ransom. However, that plan is destroyed because James Bond is able to put an end to it. However, the mysterious head of this organization, one Ernst Stavro Blofeld, gets clean away. That is, until the next book, which is On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Now, the major thing that happened in this story is that Ernst Stavro Plofeld tries to take the world by ransom again, this time by the use of biological warfare. Basically, he threatens to destroy just about every crop 
in the United Kingdom if his demands aren't met. But first he sends him a little sample to show that he means business. But once again, James Bond is able to thwart him. During these adventures, he falls deeply in love. One Tracy, the only daughter of the head of a massive crime organization. His love is so deep that he actually ends up marrying her. But unfortunately, Ernst of Roblofelt wanted revenge. And so, he gives the order to have her executed. It was meant for Bond to be killed, but unfortunately he just was not in the line of sight. And it is there that we kind of pick up on You Only Live Twice. Now the story is very oddly put. For some odd reason in the first chapter it just kind of starts off with Tanaka and Bond just being best friends and he's about to reveal a big secret. And then the next chapter starts where I feel the book should have started. I'm talking to the local psychiatrist about James Bond's condition. Obviously after Honor Majesty's Secret Service, he is quite distraught at the idea that the only woman that he ever truly loved had been murdered. So he has been messing up job after job after job, just barely escaping each time. So M is either thinking, A, give him an impossible job to shake him out of this funk, or B, just fire him completely, but with full honors. He decides to promote him and send him on this impossible task of getting the important cryptography information. Now the very interesting thing is when they go in depth to this Dr. Shatterhand as well as his hideous wife as they all describe her as. Upon further inspection, this is the same Ernst Stavro Blofeld and the wife is Irma Bunt, the woman who pulled the trigger and killed Bond's wife. With this information, Bond is out for revenge. At first he thinks he should tell his superiors that Blofeld, one of the most wanted men in the world, is out there. But unfortunately he cannot get his revenge if that were to happen. So this makes the assassination attempt on the great Dr. Shatterhand a much more personal experience. It's interesting, but when they meet face to face, James Bond is still in his Japanese disguise, so they're still kind of like... I don't know, he kind of looks like James Bond, but he looks a little more Japanese. Put him in this one torture room, where a geyser would come up every 15 minutes and completely incinerate whoever was in the room. Bond, however, doesn't want to die, so he confesses. After that, there is a lot of back and forth and back and forth. And what's interesting is they try to make Blofeld a more compassionate supervillain, if that makes any sense. Basically stating that Operation Thunderball was a way to say, you know what, nuclear bombs are a threat to humanity. I'm basically just showing them what the problem is. And then all of a sudden, all around the world, people would talk seriously about nuclear disarmament. Other than just putting it as a fancy headline in the newspaper. And then with Honor Majesty's Secret Service, he's basically saying England is dying as it is already. Only when it's completely dead will it ever rise back up again. In that he's doing a service to humanity. Bond is obviously not buying this, and he's still disturbed that he gave the order to murder his wife. So there's some pretty intense action in there, and just like the end of Goldfinger, it's basically just... Both of them at each other's necks, while Bond has just gone full animal, just going, Die, Blofeld! Die! <laughs> it's intense! And rightly so. Now, as I mentioned, Bond is able to get away in the famous balloon. But right before he does that, that little geyser I was talking about, he sabotages the controls, and that is how he is able to blow up the mysterious castle. One last thing to mention before I start comparing this book to the movie. I remember seeing a behind-the-scenes look about how they adapted this book into the movie, and this book was really controversial when it first came out due to its betrayal of death. I mean, there is just so much gruesome death described in these pages, and some of them kind of on the hands of the, the castle of death, but others just in the idea about how these Japanese people are committing suicide. So, how does it compare to the movie? 
Well, this one was a little different. Basically, I like to try to finish the book and then watch the movie. But I basically ended it right at the James Bond escape from the castle after Blofeld died. I figured that was a good enough point to actually start watching the movie. And there's actually quite a lot of references in here. For example, they call the Ama girls by their name. Tiger adds San to his name. However, in the book they call him Bondo-san because I think Bond-san is the Japanese word for graybeard or someone that's like really intellectual. And while the volcano layer does seem a little out there, it does kind of make sense into the Palace of Death. Because, because there's volcanic eruptions as well as geysers just underneath the castle. So a volcano layer makes sense. Both layers end up ultimately destroyed and by the hands ninjutsu. In the book, when Bond is infiltrating the Castle of Death, there is a trick floor where basically Bond walks a little bit and then the floor basically dips like this and then he fell right down it. Very similar to how Tiger caught Sean Connery in the movie. And as I mentioned, this Palace of Death basically has every single death trap under the sun. And one of them is a pool of piranhas. Which, if you've seen the movie, there's at least two people that are devoured by piranhas. Same thing in this book, and in very gruesome detail as well. Now, one of the major deviations from the book to the film is this character of Henderson. In the movie, he's a very light-hearted character from the heart of England, who has fallen in love with the Japanese culture. In the book, he is a loudmouth Australian, who drinks too much and has hated his entire career in Japan, but has put up with it because he knows that his job is very important. In finishing this book, I have read all the Ian Fleming books except for Octopussy Slash The Living Daylights. However, those are mostly short stories, so I'm not really sure if I should count those. But this is the last one. And I can honestly say, this is not only a good one, but I had a hard time putting it down. My next book review will definitely take a lot longer, as I'm going to go back to the source of where all these book reviews started. Ayn Rand. In this time, I'm going to go to the very beginning. Her first major novel called We the Living. In a ways, this actually makes sense, because the book takes place in Russia during the Russian Revolution. So... There is a little bit of a connection, but probably the most interesting is that both books were released by Signet. The Bond book was 60 cents, while this was 95 cents. <laughs> it's kind of crazy that only a few cents more and you buy that much thicker of a book. Well, I hope you enjoyed my review of the Bond book so far. And perhaps you'll join me for We the Living next time. But just know that this one is probably going to take quite a few months to get through. It's kind of thick. <laughs> Until next time, keep having fun.